to Fully Charged News, uh, a few news stories, and then I'm going to do a quick report about my new uh, Tesla Model 3 long range that I picked up yesterday. I've only driven it very few miles. Uh, so more on that later. So I've been doing a bit of reading and I've come across some very interesting bits of information this week. A report from BNP Paribas titled Wells, Wires and Wheels came out this week and it had some interesting things to say, including this quote. We conclude that the economics of oil for gasoline and diesel vehicles versus wind and solar powered EVs are now in relentless and irreversible decline, with far reaching implications for both policymakers and the oil majors. Ew, that can't be pleasant reading for the oil industry. And remember, this isn't from some protester with a placard, this is from one of the world's leading and most respected financial institutions. It's a massive report that goes into enormous, very well researched detail. I'll post a link to it underneath this video. But here's a thing that should be pertinent to big oil companies, uh, which was kind of highlighted on Fully Charged because of the uh, recent report we did about the BP Charge Master rapid charges in their filling station forecourts. Now that is clearly a big investment from a large fossil fuel company, BP, uh, to facilitate uh, electric vehicles which don't burn oil. Uh, currently, uh, oil companies around the world, including BP and Shell, are investing about 1-3% to of their uh, investment portfolio into uh, researching and developing clean technologies. About 80% of their uh, investments are going into searching out new oil fields, doing test drilling, uh, finding new ways of extracting oil from existing wells. They're spending billions and billions of pounds every year doing that. And a tiny fraction of that they're spending on clean technology, including things like rapid charges in filling stations. Let's face it, 1% to 3% is diddly squit when you're talking about oil companies. It's a very, very small part of their business. The vast majority is obviously on the logistics and the extraction of fossil fuels, which is costing more and more. We've used all the easy to get stuff. That's the point. Now it's the really hard to get stuff. Deep sea, offshore drilling. Uh, in the, uh, the Arctic. They're doing this, of course, with the full backing of both the United States and the United Kingdom governments, which are giving them huge amounts of tax breaks, subsidies, uh, to maintain the fossil fuel supply. Because as old-fashioned governments see it, that is the lifeblood of our economy. And it is. There's no arguing with that. But maybe we should be thinking about not using it as the lifeblood of our economy. That's my argument. So we're all chipping in through our taxes to keep the profits high and to keep the, the returns on investment of all those lazy, short-sighted shareholders who still hold shares in fossil fuel companies. So there's that. But on the flip side, we've got the automotive industry. They are currently spending around 70% of their research and development budgets building up and changing their manufacturing infrastructure, building new production lines, investing in batteries. They are going hell for leather for electric vehicles. So the automotive industry is really aware, keenly aware, painfully aware that this change is happening. The oil industry not so much. They're not that bothered. I mean, it's brilliant and I totally, totally defend and support the fact that BP and Shell are putting in brilliant rapid chargers that are reliable, easy to use, easy to find in their forecourts. I'm not taking any of that back even though there's been some criticism in the comments. No, I think it's great that they're doing that. I want them to put more in. I want them to cover their forecourts in solar panels. I want them to install batteries. That's what I want them to do. There's nothing wrong with that. They've got the money to do it. They've got so much money they could put in thousands of rapid chargers all over the country. They could change the way we generate electricity overnight. They have that kind of money behind them. That's what we should be encouraging them to do. We need fossil fuels for all sorts of other things other than burning it in cars. It's a really, really important resource. I've always, always argued that. We shouldn't stop extracting oil. We should just use much less of it much more wisely. So while these oil companies are gleefully spending all these trillions of dollars finding the most difficult to get oil in the, on the planet, what BNP Paribas are very clearly saying in this very, very economically wise report is that they're likely to be landed with a lot of very expensive stranded assets. I'm really glad I don't invest in fossil fuels. That's all I can say. From purely selfish, greedy, capitalist point of view, it seems like a fairly dumb idea. And now, power cuts. 
Well, we had one recently in the UK and it wasn't over the whole country. It, it affected very large areas. It affected millions of people for a short time. It really affected transportation. A lot of trains got stuck in tunnels, poor people stuck in trains for hours, people on the subways in London getting stuck, the airports closing down. You know, it really wasn't, it wasn't a good thing. But as the facts about the power cut emerge, it's become very clear that in f the reason it wasn't a hell of a lot worse is very much down to batteries. The UK National Grid currently has around 200 megawatt hours of um, grid level battery storage and that kicked in within milliseconds of this power cut happening. Which meant that the whole incident went from normal to chaotic back to normal in less than four minutes. It's all about balance. That's what the engineers at the National Grid Control Room are doing all the time. They're balancing supply and demand. They've got to keep that really, really closely tied together. Uh, the UK runs at 50 hertz. When it goes above 50 hertz, things get a bit melty and bright. And when it goes below 50 hertz, things get a bit dull and switchy offy. I mean, I know I'm being really technical here. You know, I don't want to sort of confuse you with really complex technical terms. Switchy offy is a really good term. Now, contrary to a few knee-jerk extremist looms, this was not down to a wind farm going wrong, which is, of course, what they immediately said. In fact, the problem started with a gas generator, uh, which, which just flipped its switch. I don't know how they do it, but they, they, can, they, they blow a fuse. It stopped working. It stopped generating. That caused a big drop. They had to raise the supply as quickly as they could to reach the demand. Then and it seems like it was a lightning strike on a substation on land, the Hornsey offshore wind farm, which produces a massive amount of electricity, that also went offline. So there were two failures that, were, that amounted to over 1.5 gigawatts of power going into the system, and that caused the, it to flip out. So then they do this thing where they shed load. Not a shed load, they shed the load. So there's the load, and there's the supply, and they go, oh my God, the supply's gone down. Quick, shed the load. Chick. They switch things off, basically. That's what they do. They cut off certain parts of the grid so that they can rebalance it. But then what happens is, of course, because the load goes down, the supply goes up. And suddenly there was too much supply. So then all that extra supply, because everything got turned on to try and cover this, all that extra supply went back into the batteries that had been feeding into the grid to try and help balance things out. Now, they managed to sort this whole problem in 2 minutes and 22 seconds. I guess they're timing it because they're all in a bit of a panic. Well, the same thing happened in 2008. And then it took 11 minutes to get it back to... This isn't like suddenly they'll switch all the lights on after 2 minutes and 22 seconds. They get the grid balanced again. Then they can slowly build up the load. So they've got the grid balance and they go, right, add a bit more. OK, right, now we can switch that on. Now we can switch that on. And that took 2 minutes and 22 seconds. 2008, it took 11 minutes. Well, that is because we've got batteries on the grid. And the big question here is, we need a lot more. So not only did they use the big grid batteries, they also took some power from, uh, they, these are still pilot projects, but from domestic batteries. So there's enough people in the country that we, who have batteries that are linked to the grid and they can deliver power to the grid in, we're talking milliseconds, they just do it instantly. So there isn't that gap where you have to kind of turn everything off to, so you can get all the other generators to splutter into life and start working. That's what takes time. We need more batteries. If we had every house in the country had a connected battery and every car was on a V to G charger, and that isn't impossible, it is happening, it is starting to happen, then we've got a massive, massive you know, backup of, uh, of multiple gigawatts of, of power that we can put into the grid to balance that up so we don't have power cuts. It's really quite a good idea. Anyway, that's enough of all that nonsense. I just thought it was an interesting story. Now, let's have a report about Robert's new Tesla Model 3. Over to you, Robert. Oh my God. Oh, oh it's nice. God, this is, this is genuinely, no word of lie, the first time I've sat in a right-hand drive Model 3 and it's just amazing. It's so nice. It is so nice. <laughs> I can't believe it. Well, it's the weight. You know, we've known about these cars. A load of people who are picking their cars up have known about them for three, three plus years. We've been waiting patiently. And it's just incredible that it's now here. This is my car for the next, I don't know how many years, three, I think I've got it for. So it's on a lease. 
I haven't got the app yet set up for it. I've got to do all sorts of other things, but it, it is just amazing to be in it. And it is such, it's so simple and it feels so much smaller and more compact and tighter than the Model S. I just love it. And I'm not a Tesla fanboy. I just want to make that really clear. I'm not a Tesla fanboy. <laughs> Normally, but at the moment, I'm a Tesla fanboy. So shut up. I don't know if it'll drive. Oh. Okay, yes, I know. I just want to hit, what I really love about this place is the sound of the tires on the polished floor. Ooh. Well, that was my first short drive in this um, Tesla Model 3. It is extremely impressive, I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's currently charging at 111 kilowatts, uh, so which is about 455 miles range added in one hour. It's pretty fast. It's faster than my Model S has ever charged at this same charge point, which is the uh, services on the, a, on the M40 just outside Oxford. So this is a uh, long range, I don't think it's called extended range, I think it's called long range, they've got different names. I don't know how big the battery is, they won't say, I'm guessing it's about 70 kilowatt hours, I'm not sure. It has a WLTP range of 300 and ridiculous, which I don't think you'd realistically get. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, in the next few weeks what range I really will get. If you're interested in finding out more about the Model 3, we did a review of it earlier this year when I drove a left-hand drive one from Copenhagen to Oslo. So that was a much longer drive. Th this first drive I've done uh, just over four miles to the kilowatt hour and I could get roughly that in a Model S if I was careful. But my Model S of course was a single motor, rear wheel drive only. This is a four wheel drive. It has two motors. Uh, the, the boot is, the, you know, the trunk at the back the boot, we call it, is definitely smaller because there was a load of boxes uh, that in the old t Model S and I can't get them all in <laughs> the new one, which is why there's one on the back seat. But it costs now. OK, Model S, I had free supercharging for the life of the car and never paid for it. You pay for it up front, if effectively, and I, and I paid for it on the lease. The lease on this car is about half what it was on the Model S. The insurance, so I transferred my insurance from the Tesla Model S to the Model 3 and I got over £300 refund on my insurance. So that gives you some idea of how much cheaper it is to insure this car and to run this car. Um, there's that. Also, because I had free supercharging on that, I'm not used to paying that. Well, so far this has cost me £3.84 to add 67 miles. Because it's 20... They did tell me, of course I've forgotten. That'll come up in text below here. I forgot. It's 20-something pence a kilowatt hour. Well, I'm not that anxious about it because I don't use it very often. So I'm having a go now just to see what it's like. And it's still at 102 kilowatts. And it's at 70 miles so far. So 70 miles has cost four quid. Can I do the calculations on that? No, not now. But I will work it out. So I'll take a note of what it costs and how much I've added, um, how many miles I've added and how much that's cost. Uh, you know, because well, you charge it at home. I'm going to charge this at home for absolutely 90% of the time. And particularly now I've got a Zappi, my updated Zappi charger. I'm only going to charge it from solar at home, it's particularly in the next week. It's really nice. The weather forecast for the next week is really good. That means I'm going to get produce lots of electricity at home on the solar, which means I'm going to put a lot of it into the car. So it's all good. I won't waffle on anymore because I'm going to carry on to go home because I'm quite tired and I want my tea. Well, that's all we've got time for. I uh, hope you enjoyed that little update. Um, uh, I just want to reiterate that, uh, that I pay for the lease on my Tesla and the insurance from uh, income that I get from outside of fully charged. So Patreon supporters are not buying me or paying for the lease on a Tesla. Every penny 
of our Patreon money goes into production, into the constant grind of producing new shows for you wonderful, fully charged viewers. And all of those of you who watch this show, and boy are we grateful that you do, uh, it's about 99.9% .9 of you watch the show and it's completely free. And as I think you'll agree, the quality of this show and the subjects we cover are getting more and more exciting. We've got some amazing shows coming up for you, but I just want you to give a nod of thanks to the wonderful Patreon supporters, because seriously, without them, we could not make it. It would have to stop. So it is vitally important. That is brilliant. So yeah, please do subscribe to Fully Charged. Please have a look at the Patreon link underneath this video. And as always, if you have been, thank you for watching.